everyone, what's up and welcome. Now, before I begin, hold those dislikes, hold those tomatoes, and listen to what I have to say first. And then after that, you can decide to dislike it and throw those tomatoes all you want. In fact, I haven't had dinner yet, so that sounds a little bit tasty. Today, we're talking about these things. And I know that these are very beloved in the community, particularly on Reddit. Uh, also, you know, all of these things. He posts one like every single week. I think since this time last month, he's posted five. That's pretty insane. In fact, that's probably the first thing that should set bells off. Really, every single week, or a little bit less than a week, there is actually this much of a revolution in the meta to write this giant, like, 10,000, 15,000 word essay with all these pictures. It really changes that much every week. I don't know. I know this is a young game, but that seems a little excessive to me. So let's take a look at it. Now, this thing, this graph here, and also this graph where it shows you all this usage rate over all this time, love it, amazing, it's super awesome. There's some other charts as well at the bottom, although those are in very uh, awkward formats, making them difficult to navigate, but still, stats are stats, I love stats, it's super amazing. And if that's all this was, then I would honestly think it's awesome. I would probably shout it out and link it and reference it uh, all sorts of different times. The real issue is this part, all these words, all this stuff down here, and also this image as well, this one. And I think that this article, this blog series, is, of course, unwittingly, a pretty major contributor to the toxicity and just the bad mentality that the community has in general towards hero picks, particularly in solo queue. But even in the competitive scene, there's a lot of times where I've seen pro players do VOD reviews, kind of like how I do them, and they'll say like, oh, this team is bad. It doesn't have the exact six heroes that I would prefer on my team. You know, instead of uh, Lucio, you're running a Mercy, therefore it's garbage, the worst team ever. Uh, I've heard some, I've heard stuff literally to that extent before. And if you're a regular on my channel, you'll know that I don't go by this mentality at all. I always try to pull out the strengths of every composition. I always pick kind of strange picks in solo queue, like pre-buff Zenyatta and pre-everyone was playing her Ana. And even yesterday, we were talking about kind of a strange composition by Cloud9 in that analysis. But when you go into solo queue, and it's a problem that I see a lot of people talking about, is that everyone's super toxic and say, if you don't pick the exact six-man composition to the hero, that you know, Envious picked yesterday, you're garbage, and I'm going to flame you all match. So know that that's where I'm coming from when I'm uh, kind of talking about and calling out this article. So it starts with this image right here. And now it starts pretty objective, like, oh, just, you know, to break them into tiers, we have 95%, 80%, blah, 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 blah. But this over here is the issue, these descriptions, right? For the less than 5% over nerfed, bad, barely used. These are balanced heroes, yes, super balanced. Uh, these are like core heroes, non-swappable, possible nerf needed overpowered up here. And it's pretty obvious, especially if we look at some past meta reports. Wow, oh my gosh, all these heroes are underpowered? That's crazy. Anna is underpowered? Roadhog, who went through no changes, is underpowered and needs a buff? You know, uh, this is before the May buff, but I mean, come on, just going through the shield was not enough to bring May from F tier to being super, super good. It was just the people started playing her. It's pretty clear that just usage rate alone is not enough to justify saying that a hero is over nerfed or underpowered or useless or anything like that. And I know, Sky, but wait, if you scroll all the way down here in this little text down here, uh, I don't choose the placement and you need to take it with a grain of salt and all that stuff. Well, first of all, most people don't read all the way down that far. And if it's completely pointless and take it with a grain of salt and it doesn't mean anything, then why would you even put it? Putting that right there does nothing except for give people the false impression that these heroes are absolutely overpowered no matter what, and these heroes are balanced no matter what, these people, these heroes are over nerfed. The few people that read down to here already have that impression in their mind anyway, so when they read this, they're going to be like, okay, well, I still believe that, that initial impression that I had to begin with. I don't buy this, I'm going to write something and then later on disqualify it as actually not meaning anything. That not going to buy it. Especially when we have statements like, if you're a high-level Overwatch player, you should absolutely be playing these four heroes in all of your matches if you wish to climb. So in the very beginning of the article, remember, most people don't actually get very far down, so the most important part is always on the top. That's why you always write the most important stuff on top. In the very beginning, someone who just reads the first paragraph, which is, like I said, a majority of people, are going to read, I need to play these heroes, and if I don't, I'm going to lose. 
ignore the fact where pro players play compositions that don't include all four of these heroes all the time, and that there's plenty of solo cures who play all sorts of different heroes and have success, and the fact that this is obviously a completely untrue statement for anyone who actually knows something about the game that you need to play these four heroes, but basically all you did was stick a bunch of solo cures on a bunch of people who choose to not play these four heroes and flame them all match because, you know, this very uh, official-looking article on Overbuff said that you have to play these four heroes. You know, these four core heroes are the core of the current build of Overwatch for many reasons you already know, but I'm not going to give, but trust me, you already know them. And if you don't know them, that means you're stupid because you should already know it, so listen to me. And I know that I'm, I'm just going to keep railing on this, I'm telling you right now, for the rest of the video, but if this were just written in a little bit of a different tone, like saying, oh, well, these four heroes are really good right now why are they really good i would say that if you're say oh sky what do you think of zarya lucy reinhardt and anna i'd say yeah they're really good let's talk about why they're really good but not this dramatic all or nothing wording of like the, like this and then this it just keeps getting worse let's talk about zarya uh, why why is zarya so op well let's see she does too many things and then he lists all the things that she does this is literally the absolute most classic logical fallacy when dealing with balance for games that I see people use. And this was actually, I was on a balance forum for a certain game where this logic would like was like legit against the rules. In the rules, there, there was, when talking about the balance of a hero, don't just list their ability. But what it does though is for newer players or players who are less experienced, they read this and it's like, oh wow, Zarya is so OP, look at all this stuff she can do. She can save a teammate from this, 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 and this. Basically all this should just be put into one point. But wow, here, actually, you know what, let me try. There's a, there's a hero I think is OP as well. You see, Torbjorn is the hidden OP sleeper, and let me tell you why, because this logic apparently works. He can give everyone on your team 75 free health. He counters Tracer because of that. His armor synergizes with everyone's shields. He can build a turret. He can fight in two places at once. He can two-shot almost any hero in the game from distance. And oh my gosh, on and on it goes. Look at all this stuff Torbjorn can do. He's OP. So yeah, this is just, again, this is just playing to newer players or players who are already biased and making them think stuff that's, I mean, Zarya is strong. She, if you tell me Zarya is strong, but I'm not going to give you this ridiculous reasoning with all of these absolutes up here. And then we see the real bias come in. Reinhardt. Poor Reinhardt. He's just a bystander who's been dragged along with Anna, and he deserves to be in that tier anyway because he's such a balanced hero. Yeah, oh man, poor Reinhardt. Truly, poor, poor Reinhardt. It's not like he's always been a dominant pick for literally the beginning of history since these stats have been recorded. And then if we tick Zarya on here as well, oh, well, actually, she used to be used less. And, oh, and now they're about the same. So how is Zarya like this OP monstrosity who you have to list like all this stuff for, but Reinhardt is just poor Reinhardt. He's just so balanced and really it's only Anna. Only Anna is the person who's making him picked a lot even though Anna was released here and he was clearly being picked a lot already. And again, we stick with the wording. So uh, the seats here, the balance here is whatever. Uh, you know, the heroes chosen from this tier represent the flavor of your Anna based lineup. Again, with the wording, I'm not, I'm not saying that it's carefully chosen just to be devious to make the community toxic, but the particular choice here of saying your Anna based lineup is for anyone who actually got this far down, which is not many people going to make you think, oh, it's, you know, your Anna based lineup. It makes it personal. So in solo queue, everything has to be an Anna based lineup. Just again, reinforcing the point. I'm not saying this is intentionally devious wording, but that's the result. And then this entire thing and the previous articles too are just full of this East versus West stuff like oh you know east versus west he was used 45 percent of matches in the eastern team roadhog something large was afoot because roadhog was picked like a couple times more than usual and this as an article it's disguised as a very objective like stats based article so every once in a while he does drop in like oh, my conclusions are based on stats but then he intentionally chooses the stat that makes his point the best so here out of 20 out of 211 distinct sides what like what even statistic is that no one says oh yeah after the, uh, i've never heard anyone talk about distinct sides as a statistic in overwatch before and there's a reason for that so he's trying to say the pharah appeared in only si 17 of them so he's trying to make this sound very very dire like pharah is in a really dire state 
only 17 out of 211 distinct sides. And as far as I know, this could be true, who knows? But the way he presents it, well, let's go into the statistic. Let's see what this actually means. So remember, each game of Overwatch has at least four distinct sides because you have offense, defense, and then you switch defense, offense. And then if you keep going in more rounds after that, it keeps switching more. So at least four, on average, let's say on average six distinct sides per match. So we have, like you said, 200 distinct sides divided by six. That's only that's only at least like around 30 games. 30 in this case we came up to 33.3333 games, right? So around 30 games. So I'm not saying this is the case because I don't uh, I haven't looked at the raw stats. I don't have the raw stats, but in this case it's possible that Farah appeared in over half or about half of the games played in his sample size. I'm not saying that is the case, but you can see how this stat could be misleading. Seven, fair pick 17 times in 33 games, that could be the case. And so it makes me wonder why he picked this very strange statistic. Is he intentionally hiding the fact that Farah actually appeared in a lot more games than she really did with this distinct sides thing? Now, yeah, Farah is not the best, most OP here in the game, but certainly this 17 out of 211 statistic makes it sound a little bit more dramatic and dire than it really is. I'm sure most people would agree. And then he actually even goes on to say, well, most of these were for Cloud9 and FaZe who went deep and ran all the way to the finals. Oh, well, so Farah was apparently played on teams that won a lot, and yet you're presenting her as this dire thing. Then we're in this last section where, by the way, every single section drops this Korean thing. This, and I don't understand what the point of that is. Oh, perhaps the legendary Korean research and preparation was not so legendary. I don't know. Like, come on, dude. In this article and his previous few articles, he's been dropping throughout the entire thing all of this stuff where, oh, Koreans are Koreans and Westerners are Westerners. And let's talk about this racial thing that's going on. But anyway, we finally come to, like I said before, as usual, I'll caution you to take everything I literally just said, like all the tiers, uh, the F tier in particular, with a grain of salt. It only represents the usage of the top levels of Overwatch. It's not meant to tell you literally anything at all. Okay, well, thank you for invalidating all of these tiers that I've already explained were completely pointless to begin with. So if, like I said, if you don't mean that these are literally always over nerfed or these are literally always overpowered, just don't put those there. Just don't put them there. Take it off and just have the tiers like that. And right below it, immediately below it, don't wait until all the way down, immediately below it, say, hey, don't take these tiers as power tiers. They're literally just usage rate to give you a better... Uh, picture of what that is or just don't even put it there because this is already good enough and then as we approach the end of the article he of course has to, i was alluding to this before but he has to do his korea versus west thing and this isn't just him this is reddit and a lot of the communities really like the korea versus europe NA story which is cool by the way like when I watch a tournament and NA it's like NA versus EU or something I, I like to cheer for the NA team because that's where I live of course however when I do analysis and stuff I'm not I'm not obsessing over the differences like yesterday when I did the Cloud9 game I wasn't like oh yeah so Shurfor is going to pick Bastion here classic NA move like, clearly, it's because he's North American. That's why he's picking Bastion. No, I was just talking about it. Why? It's weird to bring up nationalities to the obsessive extent that some people are bringing them up. And then if we read it, there's basically no difference. He even admits himself to subtly different regional medals and it, it metas. It is very subtle, by the way. Of course, uh, as we progress, you have to have some more racist statements. Like, the only other standout is Diva, who has picked more in the West than the East, surprisingly, given her Korean StarCraft 2 Pro lore background. What? Oh my god, I can't believe no one has read it, or probably someone has, I just haven't read their reply on Reddit or whatever. I, I can't believe that he just says this, like, oh, I'm surprised they don't pick the Korean hero because the Koreans. That's... Huh. And then basically, I'm not going to go through it. You can look at it yourself. He himself said it was subtle. And let me tell you, it is a subtle difference between the two regions. And then he tries to explain this subtle, basically non-existent difference by saying, oh, it's distance and all these factors that make Korea so much different than Europe because Koreans are just Korean, you know, and they're, they're following the West as the true innovators because they have, well, like, I don't even know what he's talking about. I'll tell you why there's a difference. It's because they're different teams. I'm sure if I took, and I don't have the stats, unfortunately, if I took 10 
European teams, like high-tier European teams, split them randomly down the middle and assigned half of them Korean names and did this same analysis, I would, you would also find that those teams are subtly different. Surprise, surprise, because they're different teams with different players. And then I could post that analysis to Reddit and everyone would be talking about how, oh, yeah, um, those, those two teams are so different because of where they come from. Now, of course, don't ignore real differences. Like if Korean meta is really different than European meta, for example, then it's okay to talk about it. There's no problem. But to look specifically for this stuff and to obsess over it is silly. I'll give you an example with Dota. This is a more old school Dota. China was always very famous for running the 4-1 four, uh, four lineups where they would have one hero that would farm as much of the map as he could, trying to get as strong as possible, while the other four heroes basically went around defending him, putting up war, like making sure that one hero got as farmed as possible, got a bunch of rapiers and just went and whomped uh, the game after 40 minutes or something. Europe, however, was uh, decidedly different. They were running more of an action, action-y sort of style, ganky sort of style, and they would run five farm light heroes, and they would do more map control oriented play. And that was a real difference that you could see in the European versus Chinese teams. That's why you have Chinese rice farmer as the joke when you're talking about farmers in these MOBA games, because it used to be a real difference. And that was also during a time when these competitive games were not on the national level. You didn't have this national composition competition. So literally Chinese players would never play against European players, never even watch them play because they didn't care. But, and that would create a distinct meta. But nowadays people know about that stuff. There are these international turn tournaments very on in the game's life cycle. These teams are already looking at the other sides of the world. And like this guy says, Oh, there's a problem with distance. It's the internet. The distance doesn't matter. Trust me for this sort of stuff. So there is a reason why there's really very little discernible difference between the Korean and Western meta in this game as opposed to, or the East versus West in this game, as opposed to in older games, older titles like Dota, there would be huge differences, or StarCraft, for example. This is just, it's just not that way anymore. And then finally, just to be thorough, I'll finish the end of this article where he's talking about like this amazing resurgence of Roadhog, and then he gives this graph clearly showing that Roadhog is not... Like, if you were to draw a best fit line to this, it'd be pretty much flat, slightly curving upward, along with May, slightly curving upward. Like, this, this one week, Roadhog slightly increasing by, what is that, 10% usage rate, means that there is the new Roadhog... Uh, Thing. And if you read this, he really goes on about Roadhog for a very long time based on this one single week of a kind of low tier, low tier tournament, people playing Roadhog a little bit more. So uh, just another example of taking a very, very minor statistic and just blowing it way out of proportion like this article always does. So anyway, guys, I think this turned out a little bit rantier than I wanted, a little bit harsher, actually, than I probably wanted it to be. But... I mean, it's kind of ridiculous. This is clearly just promoting a toxic, absolute attitude of you need to pick the right heroes. Even it's supported on throughout the entire article, except for this one little little spot. But I, come on, you can't count that. But yeah, that's that. These are very popular on Reddit, and this reasoning, this logic, and it's not just this one, guys. It's all most of the previous articles, I obviously didn't read every single one, but they all seem to have this same theme. This pretty much embodies the toxicity issue that so many people are talking about, where everyone is so obsessed with the competitive quote unquote meta that it's ridiculous and just very, very confrontational in solo queue. And maybe in the future, I'll make a video talking about how to look at tournaments and the pro meta in a healthy way and glean actual insights from it. But honestly, I'm sure that this article was written, was written with a good intention. Like I said, I love the stats, put a lot of work into it, but just this entire thing, I don't know how it used to be a long time ago, but whatever it was, it has devolved into a basically dramatic, sensationalist, clickbait stuff. And it's harmful and it's toxic to the community's mentality. So I hope you at least enjoyed. Didn't mind my ranting sort of style. I think that this had too much. Hope you got something out of it. Maybe learned something. Maybe even had a little bit of fun. So stay positive and have a great day. Peace out, guys.
if that's all this was, then I would honestly think it's awesome. I would probably shout it out and link it and reference it uh, all sorts of different times. The real issue is this part, all these words, all this stuff down here, and also this image as well, this one. And I think that this article, this blog series, is, of course, unwittingly, a pretty major contributor to the toxicity and just the bad mentality that the community has in general towards hero picks, particularly in solo queue. But even in the competitive scene, there's a lot of times where I've seen pro players do VOD reviews, kind of like how I do them, and they'll say like, oh, this team is bad. It doesn't have the exact six heroes that I would prefer on my team. You know, instead of uh, Lucio, you're running a Mercy, therefore it's garbage, the worst team ever. Uh, I've heard some, I've heard stuff literally to that extent before. And if you're a regular on my channel, you'll know that I don't go by this mentality at all. I always try to pull out the strengths of every composition. I always pick kind of strange picks in solo queue, like pre-buff Zenyatta and pre-everyone was playing her Ana. And even yesterday, we were talking about kind of a strange composition by Cloud9 in that analysis. But when you go into solo queue, and it's a problem that I see a little bit, just usage rate alone is not enough to justify saying that a hero is over nerfed or underpowered or useless or anything like that. And I know, Sky, but wait, if you scroll all the way down here in this little text down here, uh, I don't choose the placement, and you need to take it with a grain of salt and all that stuff. Well, first of all, most people don't read all the way down that far. And if it's completely pointless and take it with a grain of salt and it doesn't mean anything, then why would you even put it? Putting that right there does nothing except for give people the false impression that these heroes are absolutely overpowered no matter what, and these heroes are balanced no matter what, these people, these heroes are over nerfed. The few people that read down to here already have that impression in their mind anyway, so when they read this, they're going to be like, okay, well, I still believe that, that initial impression that I had to begin with. I don't buy this, I'm going to write something and then later on disqualify it as actually not meaning anything. That not going to buy it. Especially when we have statements like, if you're a high-level Overwatch player, you should absolutely be playing these four heroes in all of your matches if you wish to climb. So in the very beginning of the article, remember, most people don't actually get very far down, so the most important part is always on the top. That's why you always write the most... Hello everyone, what's up and welcome. Now before I begin, hold those dislikes, hold those tomatoes, and listen to what I have to say first, and then after that you can decide to dislike it and throw those tomatoes all you want. In fact, I haven't had dinner yet, so that sounds a little bit tasty. Today we're talking about these things, and I know that these are very beloved in the community, particularly on Reddit. Uh, also, you know, all these things. He posts one like every single week. I think since this time last month, he's posted five. That's pretty insane. In fact, that's probably the first thing that should set bells off. Really, every single week, or a little bit less than a week, there is actually this much of a revolution in the meta to write this giant, like, 10,000, 15,000 word essay with all these pictures. It really changes that much every week. I don't know. I know this is a young game, but that seems a little excessive to me. So let's take a look at it. Now, this thing, this graph here, and also this graph where it shows you all this usage rate over all this time, love it. Amazing. It's super awesome. There's some other charts as well at the bottom, although those are in very uh, awkward formats, making them difficult to navigate. But still, stats are stats. I love stats. It's super amazing. Important stuff on top. In the very beginning, someone who just reads the first paragraph, which is, like I said, a majority of people, are going to read, I need to play these heroes, and if I don't, I'm going to lose. Ignore the fact where pro players play compositions that don't include all four of these heroes all the time, and that there's plenty of solo cures who play all sorts of different heroes and have success, and the fact that this is obviously a completely untrue statement for anyone who actually knows something about the game, that you need to play these four heroes, but basically all you did was sick a bunch of solo cures on a bunch of people who choose to not play these four heroes, and flame them all match because, you know, this very uh, official looking article on Overbuff said that you have to play these four heroes. You know, these four core heroes are the core of the current build of Overwatch for many reasons you already know, but I'm not going to give, but trust me, you already know them. And if you don't know them, that means you're stupid because you should already know it, so listen to me. And I know that I'm, I'm just going to keep railing on this, I'm telling you right now for the rest of the video, but if this were just written in a little bit of a different tone, like saying, oh, well, these four heroes are really good right now. Why are they really good? I would say that if you are say, oh, Sky, what do you think of Zarya, Lucy, Reinhardt, and Anna? I'd say, yeah, they're really good. Let's talk about why they're really good. But a lot of people talking about is that everyone's super toxic and say, if you don't pick the exact six-man composition to the hero that, you know, Envious picked yesterday, you're garbage, and I'm going to flame you all match. 
So know that that's where I'm coming from when I'm uh, kind of talking about and calling out this article. So it starts with this image right here. And now it starts pretty objective, like, oh, just, you know, to break them into tiers, we have 95%, 80%, blah, 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 blah. But this over here is the issue, these descriptions, right? For the less than 5% over nerfed, bad, barely used. These are balanced heroes, yes, super balanced. Uh, these are like core heroes, non-swappable, possible nerf needed overpowered up here. And it's pretty obvious, especially if we look at some past meta reports. Wow, oh my gosh, all these heroes are underpowered? That's crazy. Anna is underpowered. Roadhog, who went through no changes, is underpowered and needs a buff. You know, uh, this is before the May buff, but I mean, come on. Just going through the shield was not enough to bring May from F tier to being super, super good. It was just the people started playing her. It's pretty clear 